personal health services, but different kinds of financial arrangements. Morning, George. Morning, Charles. Morning. Some people could afford them. Others could not. Some places were well off for hospitals. Others were unlucky. This new health service will be organized on a national scale as a public responsibility. The cost of the service will be met from rates, taxes, and national insurance, and so everyone will pay for it. Hmm, thought there was a catch in it. And everyone will benefit from it. I say, thanks a lot, old man. It's all yours, whenever you want it, with your own choice of doctor. And that goes for the whole family. The scheme is comprehensive. It's not only to help you when you're ill, but to help to keep you well. And, of course, the younger generation will stand to gain the biggest benefits of all. Thank you. I, I wanted you to see that film because the promise of a national health service for everyone, free at the point of need, is as relevant today as it was when that film was made in 1948. But a lot has changed in that time as well. 97% of the babies born in England since 1948 have been born into the National Health Service, myself included. The cartoon baby up there is now a cartoon pensioner. We're living longer, healthier lives. Medicine's been transformed, and we're on the cusp of another revolution with genomics, artificial intelligence, personalised medicines. I work for an organisation called NHS Digital. We focus on the health service in England, which means that we serve 53 million patients and members of the public, 1.3 million health and care workers, we provide data that underpins medical research to a community of scientists and researchers. And we support all of the people, whether they work inside or outside the NHS, who collectively work together every day to keep this service running. I'm privileged to work with some talented designers, user researchers, developers. So I want to tell you a bit about the work that we're doing and how we work. I also want to show you some of the things that we've been make, making recently. And then think about the future and the role particularly of designers and design as we move into that, that new world of genomics, AI, personalised medicine. We have around 40 designers working at NHS Digital in an organisation of around 3,000 people. So in some ways it feels big but also very small. Our design capability is about the kind of work that we're doing. So sometimes we're designing and building end-to-end -end the complete solution for something like the National NHS website. But actually, a lot of the stuff we do, we're just a small part of someone else's bigger end-to-end -end system. Services are commissioned locally. They include elements supplied by third parties. Patients experience the NHS at a local level, not just the bits that we deliver nationally. So the makeup of our design team reflects this. We've got around 20 or so interaction designers working hands-on with the interaction of the digital services that we're delivering. Graphic design is really important to us because we're working with what must be the UK's most trusted brand, that blue NHS lozenge. And increasingly, we're also developing a service design capability because we need to understand how the things that we make will fit as part of the overall service. As Lou Down at the Government Digital Service would say, services need to be designed from end to end and from front to back. It won't surprise anyone who knows the world of public sector design in the UK that we use a lot of post-it notes. We work in agile, multidisciplinary teams. But when we work at NHS scale, it's not just about having a designer embedded in a single team. It's also about all of the designers being able to talk to each other, get peer review, share their work, make sure that the stuff that we're doing will work coherently as a whole system. So we have, I've worked over the last year or so on developing design leadership, a career ladder for designers. And we are a team, an inside, in-house team. So we just recently got signed off a set of job descriptions for all our designers that are graded and assessed as 
equivalents to the pay scales that are nurses, pharmacists, NHS managers are on too. We're not special, we're insiders in the NHS. I spend quite a lot of my time trying to explain what we do to people who aren't designers. And often I come back to this really wonderfully economical definition of design by Jared Spool, who says, design is the rendering of intent. Um, without intent, rendering might be fun, it might be fine art. There are many good reasons why one might do it, but it won't deliver an objective, won't achieve an outcome. On the flip side, we have lots of people who are great at stating the intent, but without the ability to make it real, it will stay forever a paper strategy. So our designers need to understand the intent and be able to explain why they're working on what they're working on today, but also have the technical skills to make it real and turn it into something that patients, the public, clinicians will be able to use. The user needs that we meet are many and varied, but I think there's a sweet spot that many of our services have to hit. Everything has to be clinically safe and effective. We have clinicians embedded within our teams because anything that we do under the NHS logo, people will expect to be safe, to be effective. But the safest thing would be a service that nobody ever used. So we have to make sure that things are actually usable practically in the context that they're going to be used in. If something if the context of use is mobile, we need to make sure that the service will actually work on the mobile devices that people have. And there's a third dimension, the emotional user needs. If we present a piece of information on our website which is clinically accurate, practically correct, but doesn't meet someone's emotional need, then we haven't met the need. The person who will probably go from looking at the website to making a doctor's appointment to phoning up the 111 service um, because we haven't really met their need. So our designers need to work with intelligence, with empathy. They need to reconcile these diverse user needs in the kind of services that they make. It's really easy in health and care for people to become disempowered. So people can be disempowered by worry, by illness itself, by disability, by social circumstances, and I think in the past, sometimes people have been disempowered by the way that we in the NHS have designed and built services without thinking about the way that they're actually going to be used. So I've encouraged the design team to think not just about user needs and the deficits, the things that people come to the health service to fix, because sometimes people do come to it as a low ebb, but also to think about people's assets, what they can do, what they have that might contribute positively to someone's recovery. We need to involve people to co-design with them, with patients, with staff, with family carers, with the third sector, charities, with everyone who's a part of that bigger system that goes together to be the NHS. We place a high priority on accessibility and on inclusion because statistically the people who are most at risk of having large sort of complex health and care needs are also the most likely groups to be digitally excluded. So this is Hastings Pier at dusk, where our partners working on our widening digital participation scheme have been spending time working with people who are homeless to try and understand how the smartphones, which many of them have, many of them lack the data to access, it, to access services, how can we unblock the things that would help them to get best use out of digital tools and services? It's about going the furthest first to make sure that we're not losing, leaving anyone behind. The NHS constitution says that this service is for everyone. On the uh, wall of the studio where the team were working on the NHS website redesign, for a long time we had this quote from Mikey Dickerson. He was brought in to help fix the American healthcare.gov website under the Obama administration. And he said, <laughs> he said, it's just a website, we're not going to the moon. Um, we've spent quite a long time now and we finally achieved a, a sort of tipping point during the summer migrating the NHS national website away from Microsoft SharePoint 2007 <laughs> don't laugh <laughs> to a mobile first accessible open source platform that feels more like 2018 um, 
And as we did that, one of the things we questioned was the name of the website. It was called NHS Choices. Um, we talked to users and they didn't really understand what that meant either. So we said, well, what would you call it then? And they said, well, it's just the NHS website. So that's what we've called it. It's just the NHS website. Um, it's just a website. It has about 48 million visits a month. Around a quarter of UK healthcare related web traffic will come through this website on a journey at some point. But we think that it's about not just having a different channel to access health and care information and services, but also a different relationship with the health service. There's good evidence that people who are in control of their health and care get better health outcomes. So as much as we want the universal safety net to be there for people when they're ill, we also want this place to be somewhere that people will come to when they're well, that helps them stay well, just as back in 1948 we were promising this was about prevention and wellness as well as about curing illness. There's a wide range of contexts, user needs, emotional states that people might come to this website in. So we need to think about a short, rapid, acute need, someone in the middle of the night needing to know where they can go for help. At the same time as we might be thinking about someone who's managing a lifelong condition and the steps that they take, the times they come back repeatedly to access different bits of the NHS. So I told you there'd be post-it notes. Um, this is a team who worked on type, type 1 diabetes. And they spent time interviewing users. They mapped the whole journey from not even knowing that you have a problem through some trigger which prompts someone to seek medical help to getting a diagnosis of a potentially lifelong condition, getting them to grips with that diagnosis and then getting control of it. The sticky notes on the top, the pink ones, are quotes and insights from patients. And the ones on the bottom are quotes and insights from clinicians, because it was important to understand both perspectives in this. And the team also looked at the emotional highs and lows of the journey. And when we did, we understood something that I, is a pattern that I've seen repeated in some other services and other conditions that we've looked at too, which is that the point where people most needed the NHS website to help was at that point just after a diagnosis, when they had a lot to get their head around, they had a lot to get to grips with. Now, previously, the website had structured all this information in a sort of clinically correct way, tr talking about diabetes the way doctors saw it. What we've done here is turn that around to talk about diabetes at the moment in time and bring together the tools and useful things that someone might need when they've just had that potentially life-changing diagnosis. Some things really are life and death. I mean, this is, um, this is a, a simple question being asked in the new 111 online service. So if you, have people heard of the 111 phone service if you need help out of hours and your GP's not open? We now have a, an online version of this, so you can go through and answer those same questions. Um, depending on the questions you answer, it's kind of a choose-your-own-adventure of illness. Um, you, this could lead to an ambulance being dispatched or to you being recommended to go to your nearest A&E, &E, or, or maybe if it's less acute, something that you can do yourself at home. So if we get this wrong, literally it is a life and death service. On the other hand, we need to be careful not to tip too many worried well people into accident and emergency units, because that wouldn't be an outcome that would help the health service either. So the team, although they're up dealing with quite a specific set of questions at a moment in time, they need to understand the whole system, the complexity of how out-of-hours emergency care and non-emergency care works in any particular area. Consent, um, data privacy, confidentiality are all things that rightly are really important to patients and the public and to us as a health service. So we've made it easier for people to opt out of having their personal data used in medical research. It's quite a complicated thing, and most people haven't really thought about that stuff before. So the designer who's worked on this has followed quite a rigorous hypothesis-driven development and design and development approach 
to really optimise not just getting people to tick the box, but making sure they understand the box that they're ticking um, using multiple different routes. We're now in public beta with this and still iterating it to make sure that people really understand what their choices are. A simple page about paracetamol. Again, everything on this website is clinically safe, accurate, been checked. Um, we researched this page and it's, you know, it's clear, it's simple. But one group in particular told us they had a problem with it and that was parents because the previous version of the page mixed together information about paracetamol for adults and paracetamol for children. And that made it difficult for parents to rely on the information on the page. So we split the two out. Now we can give you a page of information about paracetamol for children, which will tell you the age appropriate doses. It's clinically safe, probably safer. It meets a practical need because it's hard to imagine a scenario where someone comes online looking for doses for both adults and children at the same time. And it meets that parental emotional need to be absolutely sure that you're giving the right dose of paracetamol to your child. We've had to diverge before we could converge. I, I'm a firm believer that design patterns are not designed, they're found in the emergent from the work of the designers. So when I arrived in the team about 15 months ago, I was worried that we were about to start converging on some design patterns that didn't feel like they'd been well tested across a wide enough range of different services. So one of the ways I made myself unpopular as a head of design was by telling the designers to go on and keep solving their own problems for a little bit longer. So we generated a little bit more um, alternative ways of doing things, deliberately diverged. And then when we brought things back together again, there's a, a, one of the marathon sessions there where we started to get groups together looking at all the different work and the different things that have been done. I have more confidence that the headings and the styles that emerged would genuine, genuinely stretch across the wide range of stuff that the NHS website needed to do. Um, we then now wrapped that up into a set of styles and a design language that's, again, accessibility tested, that's mobile first, that will start to be a bit more robust. As I said, we're doing this stuff for the national NHS website, but we're also aware that users' journeys dip in and out of bits of NHS branded digital estate that are hosted all over the place and commissioned by many different people. So one of the things we're trying to do is drive some more consistency by sharing the standards and the work that we do. This is the new NHS digital service manual, um, inspired and we're trying not to reinvent the wheel of the government service manual, which is a brilliant document, but also adding some of the stuff that's unique to the NHS, which I think is important to inspire our colleagues throughout the wider system. So we have a set of NHS digital design principles. Um, within a few days of us putting them online, this team up in the northeast working on a local personal health record had printed them out, stuck them on the wall, and we're already using these principles to help make better design decisions. So, so driving consistency through a massive distributed ecosystem over which we have influence but not always control is one of the big challenges that we've got. I've always wanted to stand on stage and do that kind of, and there's one more thing. The NHS app um, is in private beta at the moment. We're looking to move into public beta in the coming months. Um, when Matt Hancock, our new Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, presented this a few weeks ago, um, I, the, we were sort of air punching when we heard the speech because he said, he said, I like it 
He said, but that's not the important thing. What's important is that it's been tested with users and insight driven by user needs and user research. So we feel like now we've got support from the top to work in this user-centered way. But I want to look ahead, because the theme of today is about intelligence in design and looking to the future. And I want to think about, well, how does that stuff that we're doing now relate to the world that's coming next? Um, over the summer, I spent some time reading into the, kind of the history and the science of um, genomics and artificial intelligence. And I'm, I'm no scientist or I'm no doctor. But what struck me was that um, the scientific research community in medicine is on the verge in this generation of opening the black box of the genome. Some mechanisms which we kind of known that they did some things, but didn't really know how they did those things, have become much more transparent. Scientists are now really starting to understand how DNA, RNA, enzymes, proteins, inside cells do what they do. And if you understand those things, then you could actually create some medicines, some interventions that will really be life-changing for patients. At the same time, strangely, computer science seems to be going in the opposite direction. It's sort of moving from these really simple, understandable digital systems to new AI technology, things that have black boxes in them where we're told, oh, this stuff is too complicated. We don't know how the computer makes this decision. You'll just have to take it on trust. And I have to tell you, no one in the health service is going to accept that. Um, Doctors, clinicians need to understand how things work. They need to have that assurance. Um, the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers says, employ black box software services or components only with extraordinary caution and ethical care because they tend to produce products that cannot be fully inspected, validated or justified by ordinary means and thus increase the risk of undetected or unforeseen errors, biases, and harms. I'm not going to get anything that has unforeseen errors, biases, or harms past our clinical governance. So we have a new code of conduct for the use of data-driven technology um, in health and care. Um, when we move from a pure science to an applied science, Intent has to be centre stage. It's not about, look at this cool technology. It's about, what's the context of use? How does it do what it does? And specifically, what's the intent? When I hear people talk about ethics in artificial intelligence, um, it's an important discussion. But often, what I think they're really talking about is intent. They're talking about opacity of who's setting the goals and um, how we'll know whether they're the right goals or not. So in health and care, we need to understand those goals. And here's the kicker, right? Computers don't have goals. Um, as Professor Margaret Bowden says, the fact that a computer is following any goals at all can always be explained by the reference to the fact that some human agent put them there. That's why responsibility for the actions of AI systems lies with their users, manufacturers or retailers and not with the systems themselves. So some human somewhere, and often it will be the clinician um, treating a patient, will have to take responsibility for how these things work. And in order for them to do that, there has to be clarity of intent and clarity of operation. Both those things, I think, are under threat in the way that some systems are being presented. But I also think they're things that designers can come to the rescue and help fix. So it's time for designers to double down on intent. Intent in healthcare can be quite difficult to encode. It's challenging, it's changing, it's often conflicting. Think about the case of a small child who comes to A&E and on arrival they're seen as a less urgent case but their condition gets worse while they're waiting. Or think about an older person who wants to get home from hospital but can't be allowed home because the situation at home, they haven't got the care set up to be able to look, for that per look after that person yet. Or the parents who want to help their children lose weight, but they know that pester power always leads them back to the burger restaurant. These are not simple things that you can set a high score for and optimise. So user-centred design needs to really help unpick who the service is for, what problems it's trying to solve, who will benefit from any solutions that are delivered. Um, 
So time for designers to double down on intent. And I've got to say, this is not an area where design has always covered itself in glory. Um, who's on dribble? Anyone got a dribble? Thank you. Right, this is what design without intent looks like, right? This is that endless scroll of screenshots without context. It's the dribbleization of design where it's all about look at the shiny output, not why we did it in the first place. And if you think that was bad, just think about the dribbleization of AI or the dribbleization of genomics. We cannot tolerate this kind of stuff in health and care. We need designers who are thoughtful, who can bust their way out of the black box by understanding the problem holistically, by thinking about things from the user's point of view, by understanding the organisational context. Um, and also designers who can move up and down the stack of applying those really amazing graphic design hacks that we heard about earlier this morning in terms of you know, how, we, how we represent information and design affordances through to big systems thinking. So you know, someone needs to decide, are we going to put our attention this week or are we going to use AI to optimise the colour of the book now button? Or are we going to use it to try and understand the bottlenecks in the system that actually make appointments really hard to get in the first place? Um, this is uh, the, the designer pointing at post-it notes in the shorts there is Pete, who's um, one of our designers who's been working on the re referral system. When you get a GP referring you to a hospital appointment, there's technology in place that makes that information move around the system. Um, uh, earlier in the summer, they ran a series of design sprints to try and unpick this space. And Pete talked me through this, this wall. It got bigger as well, I think. Um, he sort of talked me along the journey. And at one point, he paused, and he pointed at one of those post-it notes. And he said, that's the point there where we could use machine learning to help the clinician understand and get confidence that they're making a good decision. And Pete was right, but he could only be right because he understood the whole process. He understood the goals that each of the actors had in this system and how, how he could narrow down on the one point where artificial intelligence might be able to actually make a difference. So good designers always show their thinking, right? So any excuse to be in that one. Um, if you haven't got transparency... Sorry, it takes a minute, doesn't it? If you, if you haven't got transparency of thinking, how do we know whether this stuff is any good or not, right? So our code of conduct says, be honest. Um, what type of algorithm have you chosen? Why have you chosen that one? How will we check if it's working well or not? Um, you know, how might we use data and insights to do complicated things, like communicate to someone with a rare genetic mutation the likelihood that they may develop a particular form of cancer? Or how do we show someone how their personal data was specifically used in the service of a medical breakthrough in research? Or to optimise the triage process so that the right people get the help that they need? These are about risks and probabilities, not black and white answers. So I think we need to develop some new design patterns and affordances that optimise for understanding, that help people to make informed decisions that put people in control rather than disempowering them in a new way. This is not an optional extra. It's about, in health and care, it's about public trust and confidence. And if we lose that trust and confidence, the terrible consequences for our ability to run a comprehensive national health service. And there's another thing that I think is very relevant to us as designers, because when I look at um, the cultural ascendancy of AI, the imagery, the kind of things that it produces. It seems to me there's a threat and an opportunity. It seems like design, well, it seems that AI is kind of moving computer science onto designers' natural territory here. These are designerly machines. When you look at what they do, they find patterns in messy data. They learn things over many iterations. They sift through stuff using emergent heuristics. And I'm going, hang on a minute, that's what my team does. 
And if I look at the diagrams of how these things work, this is a, an adversarial network where you pit two AIs against each other and you get one to generate some options and the other one to sift through and find the best ones. Um, it looks to me like a sort of mangled reimagining of this, the double diamond approach of diverging and converging through iteration in design. So there's a threat that black box AI will be seen as a substitute for intentional design process. Uh, someone recently told me, uh, we, uh, uh, not, not the national website, but another very large complex website that has um, a lot of information that's grown organically over time. And they said, what we're going to do is we're going to use AI to help people find stuff on it. And I kind of thought, well, if the information architecture of that site is still fundamentally broken, the AI is just going to learn the experience of being lost. So I said, no AI until we fix the IA, right? <laughs> we can do this together. Um, so I do think you know, design needs to own this stuff. We've got a really good story to tell. Um, we need to talk more about the processes that we use as designers and learn some new skills. But you know, that's OK, because over the last 10, 20 years, designers have had to get, get to grips with the web, with mobile, with assistive technologies, with voice user interfaces. Um, as Ursula Le Guin said, in my best definition of technology, technology is just stuff that we can learn to do. So it's to not be afraid, but to get in there. And I think you know, the, the payoff then is to pair these new designerly machines with collective human intelligence. Um, Ellen Broad, in her book about AI, um, the, the book is titled Made by Humans, because fundamentally what counts is not the software, but the data. And the data all comes from us. It's our data. So how do we pair the, lesson, the things that we learn from that data with these machines, but with informed choice, with people still in control? How would we get those 53 million patients and members of the public using the data that they generate day in, day out, as um, Stephanie was talking about, to kind of generate insights from their own lives? How do we help clinicians make better decisions, not to replace them, but to make them better at, at the job that they do? Support the research community in generating insights from massive amounts of data. Um, support the service community, all those people who deal with shift patterns, rostering, capacity bottlenecks in the health service. There's loads that we could do. Um, and when I look back at that sort of 70-year trajectory, some people tell me that the pace of change is accelerating. And I'm sceptical about that, because I think if you look at the history, the NHS has never known a time when there wasn't change. Um, but fortunately, um, we were started off by this amazing man called Nye Bevan, who said this in 1948. He said, we shall never have all we need. Expectations will always exceed capacity. The service must always be changing, growing and improving. It must always appear inadequate. Because if it appears inadequate, then that means that there's more work for us to do. And I think there's plenty more work that design can do in the National Health Service. Thank you.